Good evening. Thank you so much for spending your Thursday afternoon or evening with us, depending on the time zone you're in. My name is Claire Aguilar, and I am a board member for Women Make Movies, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting women filmmakers and the world's leading distributor of documentary films by and about women. Today, we are so pleased to be hosting this amazing and important panel, Stories of Asian and Asian American Women, Shifting the Narrative, in which we'll be talking about media representation of Asian and Asian American women, the connections between these images and the current anti-Asian sentiments and hate crimes, and ways that independent film can help shift cultural perspectives and attitudes. Our co-sponsor of the event, Asian Women United, has put together a wonderful lineup of panelists, and I know I'm looking forward to hearing from each and every one of them. The panel will begin with a series of moderated questions, and then we will open it up to the audience. I invite you to put any questions you may have in the chat. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's event, Evelyn Ibatan Rodriguez, the Chair and Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of San Francisco and the current President of Asian Women United. Born in Honolulu and raised in San Diego, Evelyn studies and teaches about ethnicity, gender, immigration, and generation. Evelyn. Hi there, everybody. Again, my name is Evelyn Rodriguez, and it's such a pleasure to moderate today's panel, Stories of Asian and Asian American Women, which seeks to explore representations of Asian and Asian American women in Western media, how these characterizations are connected to real life histories and contemporary events, like what happened in Atlanta this past March 16, and where we think media might help shift the narrative and offer new and better stories about AAPI women and our lives. Our panelists today, Christine Chai, Kay Fisher, Cecilia Tran, Eunice Kwan, our fellow Asian Women United or AWU members, and our organization has shared a valued partnership with Women Make Movies for over a decade when they become the distributors for our film, Slaying the Dragon Reloaded. When I tried to Google AWU during our planning meeting last Friday, the first three hits were ads for dating sites. And it appears that this issue has since been fixed. Just in case, please allow me to tell you a little bit more about us. AWU was founded in 1976 and seeks to explore the many facets of Asian American women's experiences and varied cultural heritages through publications and video productions. In 1988, we released our first film, Slaying the Dragon, directed by Deborah Gee. Because it was the first and is still the only comprehensive documentary exploring media stereotypes of Asian and Asian American women since the silent era, and to discuss how these images of exoticism and docility socially and psychologically impact Asian American women, Slaying the Dragon became widely used in gender, ethnic studies, media studies, and other college courses. And by the 2000s, AWU had received numerous requests to update the representations we looked at, as well as our analyses. So in 2011, we released a 30-minute sequel directed by our co-founder, Elaine Kim, Slaying the Dragon Reloaded, which looks at the earlier 25 years of Asian and Asian American female representation in visual media to explore what's changed, what's been recycled, and what we can hope for in the future. So this is a perfect segue into the first question our panel will address, but before that, I want to provide a trigger warning. Today's discussion will likely bring up hate, physical violence, and sexual violence, especially directed towards Asian and Asian American women. Also, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom Q&A feature and not the chat. We'll be taking those questions collectively during the last part or so of today's panel. So now to kick off our panel discussion, Christine and Kay, can you share your thoughts on what AW's documentaries have brought to surface about how Western media has represented Asian and Asian American women and how these representations are connected to real historical and contemporary events and circumstances 
that affect Asian and Asian American women? Christine. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm really happy to be here with you all, including with my friends and colleagues on this panel. Uh, so let me begin. First off, if we think about the mass shooting in Atlanta last month, the fact that the killer murdered six Korean and Chinese immigrant women working at massage spas, you can't compartmentalize or isolate their race and gender, and therefore you can't deny that this was a racial and gender hate crime, all of which links to the history of hypersexualization and fetishization of Asian women that's been so embedded in our culture. Because the first Slaying the Dragon film provides a lot of historical context on Hollywood's misrepresentations of Asian and Asian American women, and truthfully, this is applied to all portrayals of communities of color. Um, I'm going to refer to the films referenced in our first Slaying the Dragon uh, and how media has been linked to geopolitical and national events and policies. So to begin with, we have the Page Act of 1875, which precedes the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. And this was the very first restrictive immigration law in the US that barred the entry of Chinese women and women from East Asia to the US because they were seen as a threat to the Institute of Marriage and a danger to white males. And this was in response to the existing view of Chinese women living in the US at this time as immoral prostitutes, which most were not. In addition, their reproductive rights were criminalized for fear of populating the country with derelict children and or polluting white purity. So Hollywood, the Chinese were portrayed as dirty, evil, conniving, scheming, and in enters Anna Mae Wong, the first Asian American film star who, according to the LA Times obituary, her obituary, was deemed the screen's foremost oriental villainess. So through Wong, we were introduced to one of the initial archetypes of Asian women, the Dragon Lady, notably in her infamous role as a scheming princess Mongol slave in the 1924 film, The, the Thief of Baghdad. And of course, Hollywood had forever typecast her in similar roles to come, which she struggled with. And moving forward, the US shifted its target enemy to Japan because of World War II. Then post-Korean War toggled back to China due to the threat of its communist influence. And meanwhile, all other Asians were lumped into these same narratives. Speaking of post-Korean War, Slaying the Dragon references the 1957 film Sayonara, where we have two US soldiers, Marlon Brando and Red Buttons, stationed in Japan, who fall in love with two Japanese women, played by Miko Taka and Miyoshi Umeki. Here's our next big archetype, the submissive, passive, and servile Lotus Blossom. With regard to the US military, and this is no disrespect to my own family and community members who've served, you have to understand that there's such a long history between militarization and prostitution in and throughout Asia and the Pacific that can't be ignored. Think of all the wars, the fight against communism and the resulting presence of US military bases scattered throughout South Korea, Japan, Guam and the Philippines. Due to these wars and the poor state of several Asian and Pacific regions, these countries then relied on the capital of US military bases and the women who were often forced into prostitution were a large part of that labor force. Now returning to the media in Hollywood in particular, have US soldiers been neg negatively portrayed as consumers and abusers of this capital? Not so much and instead, Especially at this time, Hollywood glorified them as heroes, the white male savior and Asian women as the poor spoils of war who need saving either through prostitution, again, capital and or marriage. So let's look at the successful hit movie uh, in 1960, The World of Susie Wong about a love story between an American businessman uh, played by William Holden and Nancy Kwan as, can you guess? A prostitute. 
Then in 1961, both stereotypes of Asian women are portrayed in the famous musical, The Flower Drum Song, where we have the very sexy but manipulative dragon lady, played again by Kwan, juxtaposed with the more submissive, servile Lotus Blossom, portrayed again by Umeki. Both types continuing to play into male sexual fantasies and fetishes. And nothing really changes in Hollywood for years and years and years. So when the media and Hollywood have depicted Asian women as these two dichotomous representations, when we're only seen as either the disrespected, disliked dragon lady or the weak submissive lotus blossom, it hit me. Circling back to today, why have the majority of reported attacks and violence on AAPIs been on women? We could argue that in addition to things like age or stature, that the reason also intersects with these long-standing pervasive characterizations of either the hated dragon lady or the easily targeted lotus blossom these one-dimensional sexualized beings that continue to dehumanize and denigrate Asian women. So let me say this, if you haven't watched either documentaries yet, I recommend you do since both Slaying the Dragon films and particularly the first one does a great job of further explaining and contextualizing how culturally embedded these damaging stereotypes are. And with all of this in mind, um, I'm going to turn to my friend and colleague, Kay Fisher, to provide even more context and relevance. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, that was so helpful. Um, so it, in terms of the real life consequences of repeated images of Asian, Asian American women as basically hyper-sexualized people that are there to meet the desires and, and one desire and needs, right, of, of all these men, there are real life consequences. And so I wanted to focus specifically on um, um, the plethora of cases, violence, sexual violence and murders. So again, a huge trigger warning um, because some of it is very disturbing. Uh, um, there's a lot, and, and so it's very hard to summarize and, and give you uh, everything, but I'll do my best to um, give you a little, a, a, some idea of what the real life consequences are for, for Asian women. And uh, I, I, I want to start with an important quote from the for, uh, Foreign Policy and Focus, which writes, military personnel are trained to dehumanize others as a part of their preparation for war. This process and the experience of combat um, makes uh, can make them edgy, fearful, frustrated, alienated, or aggressive. And those negative feelings can often be vented onto the host communities especially women, because women are seen as more vulnerable and easier targets. And there's combined that with this very sexist idea that um, men need to have their sexual desires met with. And if, if there's not going to be some type of institutionalization of, of, um, of sex work or sex trafficking, then they're just going to go and terrorize the local woman. And um, so one of the first important uh, cases of sex trafficking and, and military backed and also state backed um, um, uh, sexual violence or sexual enslavement is of course um, the at minimum 200,000 possibly close to a million because there were all the records were burned or, or not kept um, uh, comfort women, so-called comfort women, right? Um, they were as young as perhaps 11, 12 years old, most of them um, uh, tricked, coerced, or kidnapped from their homes, um, and then trafficked to various stations uh, all across Asia by the Japanese Imperial Army in the period um, uh, leading up to and during World War II. And so you had um, hundreds of thousands of women from um, China, Philippines, um, Korea, and, and there's 13 countries, I believe, in total. 
Um, so there's there's one case, and, and still to this day, the Japanese government has has not admitted wrongdoing in a formalized way. And in fact, they are behind uh, a, a very um, uh, um, the incessant campaign in the United States and other places of the world trying to push, um, a, 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 trying to rewrite this history and. Um, with a denialist framing, right? Claiming that uh, this is not true, that this is not sexual slavery, and that these were these women were highly paid prostitutes, and, and that's encroached into various areas into the United States. Moving on with South Korea, um, <clears throat> during the Korean War and even afterwards, the United States military never left. Their, um, uh, their bases remained, in fact, close to uh, 30,000 US troops and up to 540,000 South Korean troops um, uh, remained in South Korea because technically uh, the war, the Korean War never ended. And around these bases, camp towns were established where it was bars and brothels and, and largely poor women from rural areas that were just trying to deal with the uh, absolute devastation in the post-war era were just trying to survive and, and feed their families. And so they were either sometimes tricked uh, or sometimes uh, knowingly went into, just to survive, uh, went into sex work in these camp towns. But there were a lot of uh, cases of violence and I'll just name a few. Uh, in, in 1992, for example, Yoon Kim uh, Kum Yi was murdered by private Kenneth Markle um, and, and her death led to uh, a, a large protest um, uh, in South Korea and led actually for the first time prosecution of a US soldier for murder of, uh, in the Korean courts. In 2002, armored vehicles ran over and killed two South Korean go uh, girls, um, middle school girls, I believe they were. Uh, in 2011, a soldier broke into a teenager's home near his base, raped and violently assaulted her. And all this time, um, uh, uh, militarized prostitution in general has helped to spur the development of sex tourism in other countries in Asia. Uh, and so you have sex industries in the Philippines and Thailand uh, that was spurred by US military presence there uh, during the Vietnam War. And so in the Philippines, a couple of important cases to note are um, in 2006 when Lance Corporal Daniel Smith found, <clears throat> was found guilty of raping a 23-year-old Filipina uh, uh, by the, the name of Nicole, who was insulted inside a van while his colleagues shouted encouragement. And more recently in 2014, Jennifer Laud, a 26-year-old trans woman, was killed by a 19-year-old soldier by the name of Joseph Scott uh, Pemberton. And if I may, I know my time is up, but if I can have one more minute, I just wanted to share that uh, Okinawa, there's really important and significant cases there as well. And uh, the um, the movies that Christine mentioned, one was set in Japan. Um, and, and that was because I don't think a lot of people knew this, but in the aftermath of World War II, the United States technically was an occupying force in Japan. And even though that ended, I believe in 1952, they remained in Okinawa. And Okinawa is the southernmost um, archipelago of islands in Japan. But technically this was an independent kingdom uh, and, and they were colonized by the Japanese before the United States military uh, took over. They were called the Ryukyu Kingdom. And the United States territory, even though they, they left the rest of Japan in 52, they remained in Okinawa as an occupying force for two more decades. So it was very recent. It wasn't until 1972 that uh, Okinawa was um, now return to Japan. Anyway, 70% of all US bases uh, are concentrated in Okinawa, uh, even though the Okinawan landmass makes up only 0.6% of um, the entire country of Japan. And there's a bunch of cases there too. And the most memorable one, and I'll just wrap up there, uh, it was a very, very famous case in 1995 where three US servicemen kidnapped, beat, and raped a 12-year-old local Okinawa. Okay.
you know, and girls. So we see that the, um, the effects of this and militarization are really serious and detrimental. Thank you. Thank you, Kay and Christine, um, especially for just helping us really clearly connect the dots between the dragon lady and lotus blossom images of Asian American women that Western media created and helped to disseminate and the real life specific ways this has made these women targets for stereotyping and sexual and physical violence at interpersonal and institutional levels. Now, I'd like to have our discussion pick up where Reloaded leads off. And for those of you who've yet to watch Reloaded, it closes on a somewhat hopeful note, surmising in 2011 that the internet might have the potential to enable the production, dissemination, and viewing of improved images of Asian and Asian American women that might help better challenge the problematic images that both of these documentaries discuss. So Cecilia and Eunice, 10 years later in 2021, would you say that the internet has fulfilled this promise and why or why not? So we'll go ahead and start with Cecilia. I think actually um, I'm gonna start because CC and I texted right before this and determined that, so. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for having us folks. And uh, Christine and Kate, thank you for just educating us. I feel like I'm back in my Asian American studies course and it's a great refresher um, to hear. Um, so in terms of the internet, uh, CC and I are the resident millennials in the group. So we've been asked to speak about the internet. Um, and I think it's undeniable that internet and the internet and, and technology has made it so that there are a lot more nuanced and interesting and diverse um, Asian American women representation in the media. Um, I think just in terms of like my own experience of growing up in the 90s as like a young queer Asian American woman, you know, I could maybe watch like the O word, which is terrible. Like, I don't want my life to look like that, right? <laughs> or, you know, I, I could look at, um, representation in mainstream media of Asian Americans. And um, I, I did feel like I was very influenced and, and constrained um, by what I saw um, in thinking about what my future life could look like. And I think seeing um, like really good quality nuanced content uh, made by queer women, women of color um, helped me to really come to terms and work through some of, um, yeah, some of the issues that I, I had growing up and not, not knowing what the possibilities were for, for me as a, a queer Asian American woman. Um, so in thinking about like internalization and the reinforcement of stereotypes within Asian American women communities, I feel like the internet has been amazing at um, being able to give people access to making and distributing um, quality content. Um, you know, it's not just saving face anymore. And like I can spend all of quarantine trying to keep up with all the, uh, the really good shows and books and things that are coming out about um, queer Asian American um, people. Um, so I think that it's better when we're talking about the internalization, but we all know that what you, know, you see, what I see when I go on my internet browser is not what everybody else sees, right? So um, I think that the internet has also made it worse in that we all have very different realities of um, what we see when we um, explore media images. Um, so going back to the shooter in Atlanta, um, you know, I'm speculating here, but you know, if someone really is starting out with this inkling of Asian American, seeing an Asian American woman as hypersexualized beings, if they're um, paying attention, if they're hovering or, or looking at those images, what the internet is gonna do is to reinforce that reality and to even sometimes push folks in further into exploring those ideas. Um, so when we're talking uh, about, you know, how does media representation shape other people's views of Asian Americans? How does it reinforce stereotypes or reflect caricatures? Um, and how does it contribute to racial violence towards Asian people and Asian women? Um, I think that the truth is that the internet has made it worse in, in many cases. Um, and one other observation that I really want to share because I work with um, Asian American youth, Asian American college aged youth at UC Berkeley is that I really do see how social media has uh, made it so that they're able to uh, really fully participate and 
intervene in public dialogues about mainstream representations of Asian American people, right? So when Crazy Rich Asians or Bling Empire um, are playing on tropes of, you know, really rich East Asian people being sort of like the norm or how Americans see Asian people, um, I see that there's like a very public and, um, and nuanced conversation happening online that people, Asian American people are able to participate in and, and, and um, change and disrupt that narrative. Um, and memes that I don't quite understand, but that are meaningful to, <laughs> to other people. Um, so I think that uh, that's also another way that the internet has been really great at um, helping, especially young Asian Americans just have more, um, have more confidence and more, um, see more possibilities in, in, in like their future than I had when I was growing up. Yeah, I think building off of that, what I would say is like everything else, the internet has made everything so much more complicated and that amplifies both the mix of the good and the bad. Um, I think for me, when we ended on a hopeful note and reloaded about the internet, I think the thought process was that um, we would be able to have this pathway for people to create their own content and then have a big platform to showcase it, build momentum, and it would somehow break into the mainstream. But I think as Eunice has shared, that really hasn't fully come into fruition. I think in some cases it has, um, with Asian American women in particular, you know, we see so many incredible content creators now even on TikTok um, who have large followings in the millions. And yet, um, what does that translate to? It, it's, it's people watching other people like them, um, little snippets. There are, you know, some monetary incentives, but it, there's not much crossover. I think in this last year, like everyone else, I've been at home streaming constantly and I will say that there are still moments when I see shows pop up um, or movies like Raya on Disney or um, To All the Boys um, on Netflix. And there's still that moment of, wow, like this just happened um, because it's so infrequent. And when you pause to think about, um, you know, what those it's, it's so, there's, it feels like there's so few opportunities to combat these um, stereotypes and depictions because it's, it feels like a drop in the bucket, even though it's so monumental in that moment. It's um, the harm of these tropes that were created all the way back in the 60s um, still have ringing effects. Um, and I mean, I guess since the question is about the internet and um, what it has done and, and hasn't done, you know, there are some success stories that I think in some ways I would say are more anomalies like um, Aquafina, who for many years, almost a decade, created content on YouTube before she really made a name for herself. Like that has been a success story, but it's definitely not the norm, unfortunately. Um, and I think that, especially with Asian American creators, there's also lanes for them too. You know, it's widely accepted that they'll be present in food content creation or beauty content creation, especially beauty content creation, which again is a little bit problematic, right? Um, playing back into the idea of women and Asian American women as this um, exotic standard of beauty. Um, but I think that there are, as Eunice shared, um, ways in which people are engaging with the dialogue that becomes really prevalent. Um, there was the sad case of, you know, when, when it, Kelly Marie Tran um, was casted in Star Wars, she was um, harassed so much online um, about her gender, her race, um, and it led to a big dialogue. So unfortunately, just as there are major platforms for um, people to spew hate on the internet, it's also a place to spur dialogue. Um, so there's no, unfortunately, straightforward answer to that. It's just a lot more of the good and the bad, in my opinion. Thanks, Cecilia um, and Eunice. 
for your takes on how the internet um, has both improved and, and raised new opportunities um, for better representation of Asian American women and also reproduced um, some of the problematic and pre-existing sorts of tropes um, that Kay and Christine shared earlier. In spite of the ambivalence with which we seem to view the internet as a vehicle for disseminating um, improved images of Asian and Asian American women, um, we still seem like we imagine that it might allow for more Asian identified storytellers to create and share our stories. Um, and that those Asian created stories can offer new perspectives on Asian and Asian American women and our lived experiences. So given the fact that it doesn't sound like the internet has unequivocally brought us to the promised land that we imagined in 2011, what can any of you share about the Asian and Asian American stories you think US society needs to see more of today, especially to help counter some of the ways media shaped how AAPI communities are currently perceived, which we've already discussed has contributed to the visibility of um, this most recent surge of anti-AAPI hate and violence, especially towards women. Um, and what do you think needs to happen for those stories to be seen and heard? So um, who would like to take it first? I can uh, just share very shortly. I think um, what this conversation really reminds me is how important it is for, uh, I feel like I'm sort of preaching the choir here because we're all sort of like Asian American studies folks, but how important it is for there to be historical narratives um, that are being portrayed. I think it's really um, in a lot of popular media now that I see with Asian American representation, um, like two boys who I've loved before, whatever the title is, um, you know, we have this character and her Korean mom has died. So you, you see a photo of her, you see an allusion to, oh, she, she is Asian, um, but there really isn't uh, like mainstream knowledge of Asian American history or, or narratives um, that are really important to be able to uh, have people have critical um, thinking around some of these stereotypes on their own, right? So it's not just enough that we see Asian faces on our screens. Um, I think that we really need to push for um, Asian American history uh, to be uh, made po like popular content. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that a lot of independent filmmakers, uh, women make movies, um, filmmakers are, are doing that kind of work, but um, it's, it's just not as popularized as things like Bling Empire, unfortunately. Other thoughts? Christine? Yeah, so um, kind of connected to Eunice, you know, um, I think there does need to be, of course, just a broader spectrum of Asian American narratives, right? Um, the history, yeah. But also, you know, we've mentioned uh, Crazy Rich Asians a few times, right? And uh, Bling Empire. Um, but I'm, I'm also really curious, I would love to see more diversity, right? So more of like, if Asian Americans have the largest income uh, gap in the United States, right? I'd like to see more stories of the income inequity, especially maybe around uh, working Asian American women, right? I, I don't, I don't see us celebrating or or um, relaying their stories um, very often, especially in mainstream outlets. So I, and I also believe that we need. Um, you know, to make these happen, we need the producers. <laughs> we need the people, um, we need the community in charge of, of the money and where it goes and how these stories are told. And I know that's not, that's a lot easier said than done, but, and this isn't anything new. We've been, we've been uh, saying this uh, forever, but we still need to get there. 
And I would say too, that there, you know, I think sometimes people talk about, well, maybe it's because they're not making the content or maybe there aren't enough actors. And I would really push back because as Christine said, if there are the resources there, if there are the pipelines built, um, if there are more groups like Women Make Movies to create these platforms, I really do feel like there's an abundance of artists um, and a whole generation of creators that we see now online um, who, who would really um, tell the right stories, the unique stories, the stories we like, the stories we disagree with, um, but have a real true diversity in opinions and stories um, and backgrounds. You know, I think one of the challenges of being Asian American is that we're in this big blanket um, where, you know, as a Vietnamese American woman, I've, I think I've been asked if I was Chinese more times than I could remember, or there's this, um, you know, this conflation of all the groups. Um, so I think I'd like to also see stories that are really rooted in specific cultures and backgrounds. And that could be uh, Asian Americans that are multi-generational um, immigrants or um, folks who have been in America for many generations. Those are stories that I'd like to hear. Um, uh, those are all terrific. Uh, I, I think I, I would add, um, I would like to see more uh, about Asian or Asian American women activists and organizers and their political engagement. There's a few slightly older but um, existing documentaries that Asian Women United made about uh, uh, union organizers, Asian American union organizers, um, and I'm always so surprised um, how really every year when I, I teach about um, Yuri Kochiyama and Grace Lee Boggs in my Asian American history class, a majority of my students have never heard of these to me. And I think to anybody who knows who they are, um, just iconic, incredibly legendary Asian American women leaders and activists and um, women who, who, who absolutely defies, it drives me nuts when I, I even hear Asian Americans internalize this idea that, oh yeah, we're quiet, we're not very active, we don't speak up and like, are you kidding me? No, that's absolutely not true. So I, I wish there are stories of these politically engaged, just, you know, Asian women who really push forward and who are um, um, who are out there on the streets and, and has made have made a life commitment, right? Um, both Yuri and Grace Lee Boggs dedicated their entire adult lives um, to freedom, various freedom movements and liberation movements. Um, so I would love to see more of that. Like um, uh, Grace Lee, who directed the Grace Lee Boggs movie, um, did a, 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 a series that came out on PBS recently, right? And she could be next. And it, it highlighted various different women of color, um, uh, political activists. And, and so I thought that was a Great example. And if I can, I'll just add one more fantasy show idea. I, and I'm, I apologize to my colleagues and friends in Asian Women United because I've talked about this multiple times already. But, you know, I think people do like reality shows. That's just the world we live in. I'll admit it, I watch it sometimes. And Rose from 90 Day Fiance. I just, I, she's a true hero. And I, I've watched that clip where she tells off Big Ed multiple times. And I think she should have her own reality show. <laughs> Bravo, okay. Anyone know Rose? Can someone get that message to, to Rose or to her network? Um, I just wanna add before um, we get into some of the audience questions um, to the panel's response about what other stories about Asian and Asian American women would we like to see in film? Um, you know, thinking about this, 
because this is the Women Make Movies audience, I'm sure we've all heard of the Bechdel test. And one of the criteria for the Bechdel test is that there are like two female characters who interact with each other and are talking about something other than a man, right? So one of the other um, long-standing um, stereotypes around Asian and Asian um, American women is that there are perpetual foreigners. And I would love to see more stories that have Asian American women who aren't just, you know, the arm candy on a white hetero man's, you know, arm, um, and who are interacting again with, you know, like diverse other groups of Asian Americans from different class backgrounds, from different generations, from different ethnic backgrounds to really convey the kinds of diversity um, and the, the realities, right, of being someone of Asian descent in U.S. society. So that's, that's the two cents that I'll add before um, I get to um, one of the questions that Women Make Movies has highlighted for us, which I think is really um, directly related to something that Christine said earlier in her comment, um, which was really about like, how do um, Asian American women really hold enough power, right, in um, filmmaking in order to get these stories told. Um, so one of the questions um, from our audience that any of you, not just Christine can address, is do you see any major studios or producers who are on the forefront of champion, championing underrepresented types of stories? I don't know, to be honest, I don't know, right? Um, like I'm hoping Chloe Zhao will win <laughs> the Oscars this weekend so that maybe she has more clout and more sort of power to uh, go in that direction. Um, yeah, and especially as it pertains to Asian, Asian American women, right? Um, I, I don't know, and and I feel like you know, where do we go from there, right? So again, I think it's the exposure. It's it's it's. I mean, I can't. I can only think of Chloe Zhao right now, but um, but I I feel like that's what it takes, at least in 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 the mainstream, right? Um, we've been talking about how valuable. Uh, Women make movies, and Asian Women United, and uh, and, and independent filmmakers are, um, but um, as far as getting it out into the mainstream more, you know, um, I think we, I, I, I personally, I don't know, I don't know of any, which doesn't mean there aren't, but I don't personally really know of any. I'm still at a very, very dissatisfied state, right? I, I don't want to be the person who's like, hooray, big corporations, but I do feel like because of um, the media landscape that like Netflix has created, where there's so much content being funded and generated, there's just, there is a lot more, you know, there, there are a lot more shows that are speaking to a subculture or to like a particular niche that are really good quality content. I think never have I ever was like a show that I really <laughs> enjoyed and appreciated and, um, uh, I thought that it the the support that like Mindy Kaling's been getting and, and giving to other uh, women of color generally, I think um, it really does speak to sort of that that environment changing. And for my my friends who do work in Hollywood or work in you know television or or um, mainstream like movie making in the film industry, I think that there's a real it, it it's sort of crass, but we're like you know, it's the flavor of the month to talk about race and diversity. So there, there is a, a big step towards trying to make sure that your catalog does have um, more <laughs> diverse stories, right? And, and it can be a, a boon for our community. Since Eunice mentions Netflix, um, I also am not sponsored by Netflix, nor do I want to like promote like the man. Um, but I want to give a shout out to 
some of the ethnic studies students who I had last, um, last semester, um, they did just a real kind of light content analysis of network um, produced um, TV episodes and streaming produced TV episodes to look at representations of race and the representations of the kinds of um, interracial relationships that they saw um, on both platforms. And there was actually a significant improvement in the Netflix representations. Um, and that's not to say that they're perfect. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the Netflixes of the world are taking risks and bringing in writers of color and bringing in actors of color and bringing in producers of color. And so they're, they are starting to generate um, new kinds of images. And so, um, you know, in 2011, we thought that maybe the internet was the promised land. Maybe, maybe, right, um, these, new, these, these new platforms can offer us some more hope in 2021 also. Um, I have another question from the audience, which is sort of related to this question. Um, how much do you all think it would take for more Asians in Hollywood to step up and combat this anti-API hate that's been going on for more than a year now? Um. It's such a difficult question. I saw that in the Q and A, and um, it's hard for me to answer because I I, I don't pretend that I, I I I'm even close to having an answer for something like that. But um, but I think part of uh, this type of heightened um, uh, messages of hate or um, scapegoating whatever happens. And it's not just with Asian Americans. I think it's important to bring that up as well, that we've, we've, you know, this is the week that the Chauvin verdict came out. But at the same time, we had, as I talked about with my students, you know, children killed by the police, right? Um, Dante Wright was only 20. Um, um, shoot, oh my God. Um, I think it's Adam Toledo was 13 years old, and then um, Makia Bryant was only 15, I think. So I think just the issue of humanizing, you know, um, not to sound cliche, but I think movies and stories and even books and maybe even TikTok videos, right, can gives us an opportunity to to see the humanity in people who might look different from us or um, in, in a way that I think news stories often completely gloss over and in, 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 in the lives of the you know the identity and the individual kind of just the very nuanced ways that we're human beings every day that all gets erased because we turn into numbers or we turn into statistics or just like one image that's supposed to symbolize an entire uh, range of very diverse people with enormously different viewpoints and and point of views and experiences and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think just having the opportunity to tell these stories to help humanize and 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 making sure to consume some of that instead of reality shows, right? <laughs> so that um, I, I just feel like Minari is such a great example of that, right? Here we have uh, a, a rural working class immigrant family and you really do connect on a human level. I think anybody of any background could relate to, um, you know, uh, the struggles that the father had with, you know, he had this dream and he's finding all these like blocks and walls and the struggles of the mom who had expectations and they weren't met and she's trying to communicate that. I mean, those are things that we can all relate to on a human level. And I think more stories like that just need to be promoted and uplifted. Thank you so much, Kay, for tackling a not easy question. Um, and, and thank you for reminding us of the need for 
humanized <laughs> images of Asian Americans and especially of Asian American women and also of our responsibility of folks who are consuming this, this media, right, to really support those kinds of stories and those kinds of story makers and storytellers. Um, you mentioned youth and um, one of the questions from the audience is how might we encourage our young women to be true to themselves and support them in finding ways to make their voices heard? So is there anyone who wants to try and take on that question? Well, I don't know. Um, I don't know how the person asking is defining youth, but I think in, in working with um, college aged folks, uh, one thing that has been really powerful um, for, you know, the Berkeley students that I've worked with, ha it's, it's been um, realizing that they do have a, a story of their own and that it, it's different from those around them. And especially at Berkeley where, you know, we have a lot of people who are Asian identified, who have Asian faces. I think that a lot of folks come in and feel like um, people don't really, you know, see them as individuals, faculty members, um, administrators don't see them as individuals. So I think we take them through this exercise in our, our first year seminar of, um, you know, making sure that they uh, talk to family members, understand their histories, understand like the context of their lives. And I think they find that a very empowering exercise in being able to um, really think through, you know, what are the conscious choices that they're making um, around who they are and who, like what's important to them, right? So um, we have a lot of uh, young Asian people that come in um, with a lot of messages that they've been told by their community, by the media, about what um, what their lives should look like. And I think that first year of exploration and having projects that really focus on um, spending time with those questions of like, who, who, him, who am I, why, why do I feel this way? All of those things, it's really central to unpacking some of the, the harmful messaging that they've like been enculturated in for the first 18 years of their lives. I also wanna make a plug for AWU, we have like an advice book for young Asian women. I think it's called like Dear, does anybody know what it's called? Diane. Dear Diane, I, I want to say Dear Jane, I was like, that's not right. Um, Dear Diane is actually translated in Korean. And so it's in English and Korean. And it's it's just um, advice letters written by young Asian American girls. And, you know, there's responses and it's about like, oh, you know, my mom wants me to do this, but I don't feel that way or things like that. And I think it's still relevant, even though it was published about 20 years ago. Thanks, Eunice, for highlighting how important it is, it is for all of us to um, to help folks recognize their own distinctive stories, right? Like, I think a lot of Asian American young people have um, internalized this idea that they're incomplete somehow, that their story isn't finished until they, you know, truly become that model minority and assimilate into white culture. And so it, it kind of blinds folks um, from being able to recognize and appreciate, right, their own distinct biographies. Um, I think we have time for one last question and that this one sounds like a really good and kind of future looking one. Um, would you argue that transnational media such as K-pop, Korean dramas on Netflix, and even works like Crazy Rich Asians combat and or perpetuate stereotypes of Asians and Asian Americans? I think the short answer is yes. It, I think it does both. It, it, um, I think, you know, in some ways having a, I think for the rest of the world for a long time, American media has been out there. American culture has been out there, but the reverse hasn't always been true. So I think that um, in some ways this is an eye-opening phenomenon um, and Americans can realize that there's a whole world out there. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, we still have to be aware that the types of media and the types of representation that's elevated 
and other cultures also have some of the same issues. You know, there may be glorification of um, wealth and class that um, would then, you know, um, minimize the voices of working class people. Um, so I think we need to continue to have a critical eye to whatever media we're consuming, but I think um, representation in every capacity, the more of it, like the more we have to look at and truly compare, the better, in my opinion. I'll say I'll say this. I, I think it is significant to note that um, this this is uh, like Bollywood and you know K dramas. Like that's being consumed by people of all different backgrounds, right? And um, but I I definitely I just wanted to point out that I I I don't have any data research to back me it's just my intuition but i feel like at the beginning before for example like k-pop became more mainstream it was already popular with asian americans about maybe like 10 15 years ago and people you know before it was on netflix you had to find it on you know what is it like mysoju.com or whatever like one of those probably illegally, I don't know, uh, streaming, you know, they, where they can find different shows and some are translated and some are not, but you know, a drama <laughs> Yeah, so, but it existed with with the internet. And I, I noticed that it just seemed like a lot of Asian Americans were of all different ethnicities were gravitating towards um, um, movies and series from Asia because they're finally able to see themselves in a lot more complex different types of characters as heroes you know as romantic leads and i think that's something that we really we really need to know too is is i just go going back to my earlier comment it's just about feeling humanized and 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 i think that's what media i mean because there isn't necessarily an issue of humanizing um, I guess maybe a little bit, but humanizing people in Korea, in Korean media, right? So it, it's, a, it's, I think it was very refreshing and, and clearly Asian Americans, Asian American youth were the, the leaders in starting this, this trend um, that's I think a lot more um, mainstream today. Evelyn, could I just say something for one minute? I, I just also want to make sure, like, I think we're all on the same page that representation is not enough. You know, we see that Black culture is really what American culture is at this point, right? Like hip hop, Black athletes, um, and it's, it's a lot of people are consuming that culture, but that doesn't prevent Black people be, from being killed by the police like every week, right? So I think um, in thinking about representation, it's the, the important piece really is that it creates people who are able to like have critical thinking and make connections with people that look different than them but it's it's not the end end all goal for our organization for sure thanks for closing us on that really with that really important reminder Eunice um, there are other audience questions that I just don't think we're going to have a chance to get to. And, and when, when I read that question, I was like, oh my gosh, like our resident AWU K-pop pro isn't on the panel today. Um, cause she probably would have had like a, a poetic answer, um, or response to that. And so for those of you who want to talk more about K-pop with our expert, Hana, um, for those of you who want to learn more about AWU and what other kinds of stories are already out there, um, or to give us recommendations for what other kinds of stories might be made, you can Google us at your own risk, or you can go directly to our website, asianwomenunited.org, where you can view a list that we curated just for this event of member recommended media by and about Asian American women, where you can learn about our ongoing projects and where you can contact us um, to ask more questions or again, to share your ideas. Um, finally, on the behalf of the rest of AWU, I just want to thank again, my wise um, co-members and to publicly express our gratitude to Kendra, to Emily, and the rest of Women Make Movies 
for helping create this space and time for this important discussion today and for your longstanding partnership with AWU and your decades of supporting independent women filmmakers and especially those storytellers seeking to amplify historically ignored voices and to challenge mainstream media. So I think that is a wrap. It has been such um, fun to, to bring together these voices and to hopefully um, share them with, with our audience. Thanks.